Well, hello. <laughs> Most of you know I've been very sick uh, with <clears throat> COVID-19. And today is the first day I actually got dressed and uh, in probably about two weeks. So uh, I felt finally able to do a video. I will admit to covering up a few of the dark circles, I'll tell you, because I, I look pretty sick still. But I covered them up so that I could meet with you today. And uh, I have been doing my Bible study, but I just haven't been really um, videotaping because I haven't felt up to it. But today I do. And so we're going to go back to the Gospel of John, which we had started. I think I only did one session of that before. And um, we're going to go back and look at it again. And remember that there are four Gospels that tell the life of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Only two of them were written by actual uh, disciples, the twelve that were the closest disciples of Jesus. And that would be Matthew and John, which we're looking at today. Luke was a, a Gentile and a doctor, and he, he wrote a, a gospel account. He was probably a very educated man, so he wrote an account. He was a follower of Jesus, but not one of the twelve. And the other one, Mark, is actually written by John Mark, who was a friend of Paul's and went on missionary journeys and so on. And again, was a follower of Christ, but not one of the twelve. So John was actually there from the beginning, and he is one of the 12 disciples. In fact, one of the closest disciples that Jesus had. Um, very often he talks about bringing just three of them along with him, you know, Peter, James, and John, were the closest ones, kind of like. Um, and of course, John was, was the um, disciple that he asked to take care of his mother when, at, at the crucifixion. So John was very close to Jesus, and his gospel account is so different from everybody else's. And I'm going to look at John 1 today, <clears throat> again, which is where we started before I got sick. <laughs> and, <clears throat> excuse me, John 1, um, I have to say, I was thinking about this today. And I was thinking how sometimes when I was little, young, let's say, even a teenager, um, or maybe even, even older than that, you know, I've been a churchgoer all my life. My parents took me to church when I was little, so I went through numerous Advents and Christmases. Um, and I remember at certain times that uh, they would read the Gospel of John as part of the Christmas story or part of the Advent story. And I remember thinking as a kid, what has that? Well, I don't get this. What's this all? Go back and do Luke, you know? <laughs> Luke is what we're familiar with, you know, the baby in the manger and all that. Even Matthew gives an account of of Jesus being born uh, as a human. John doesn't do that, okay? And part of the reason is that what he's really saying in his gospel is that our relationship with Jesus and our connection with Jesus did not begin when Jesus became human. Anybody can look at Jesus' life and and believe he was a, a prophet, a great man, a great teacher. John knows that. His purpose is to show us that Jesus was also God. And he's saying our relationship with God, our relationship with Jesus, did not begin at the manger. It began at creation. So he actually starts the story way before everybody else starts it. I always thought he just omitted that part. Like, get on with it. Especially because it's kind of confusing, this first part. And here's how it would have been read to me when I was young. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. <laughs> okay? So as a kid... When they read this, I'm like, word, with, what, in, what? I don't get it, you know? I really did not get it at all. And I would want them to skip right down to the next sentence, which gets right into something I could understand, which is, there was a man sent from God whose name was John, okay? And not the John that wrote this, but John the Baptist. That's the part where I wanted to start. I'm like, what are you doing with this word thing, you know? It was very confusing to me. And I began to think about, the idea of the word with a capital W, you know, but even the way that we use it now, um, we'll say, I'm as good as my word. Means if I say something, 
it's as good as me being there, okay? If I tell you I'm going to be there, I'll be there. It's, I'm as good as my word. Or uh, in the old days, they used to say, my word is my pledge, or my word is my token. In other words, I don't have to give you anything more to reassure you except just my word, okay? So our word is part of who we are. And part of who God is, is God's word. And the word that has that capital W uh, refers to the actual words that come out of God's mouth, which are as sacred as God himself. And Jesus, who is the word himself, the word incarnate, meaning the word of God in bodily form. Okay, so God is as good as his word. You know, and his word is him. They are one in the same. Jesus is one with God the Father, and he is the word that God has. And then, of course, the word also refers to the Bible because they are the inspired word of God. So all the words in the Bible, with small w, and also the capital W word because Jesus' life is here and Jesus is the word, and that is inspired uh, God himself inspired men to write this, so it is his word. And he's as good as his word. So what John is telling us here is Jesus was there way before the manger. Way before he became man, he also was God. And this is John's biggest premise, is giving proof that Jesus indeed was not just a man, not just a prophet, not just a nice teacher or a rabbi, but actually was God himself in bodily form. So he starts out with calling God, Jesus, the Word. And he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus was God at creation. He was there as Jesus as God was creating, Jesus was part of that because we have a triune God. And Jesus didn't just start, that part of the triune God didn't just start at the manger. He was there at creation. And that's what this first sentence means. So John is actually saying, when I begin my story, I'm not going to begin at the manger. I'm going to begin way before that. I'm going to begin way back at creation. He was with God in the beginning. So using that word he, we know he's not just talking about words coming out of God's mouth. He's talking about a person of God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Jesus is a creator. Jesus, the word, was there at creation. And through the, the word, through Jesus, all things were made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. Life and light come from Jesus. Life at creation and light of salvation. Everything comes through Jesus. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. So here John is saying, you know, um, Jesus, again, isn't just a man. He is the light of the world. He is God himself. And the darkness can't overcome it means there's nothing evil can do to win in the end. Uh, the, the whole thing is already taken care of. Jesus has already gotten the victory. There's no way darkness can overcome the light of Jesus. So John actually... You know, and I used to want to skip that part. I actually was skipping the beginning of the story and the most important part of the story. Because the proof number one really is, you know, that Jesus was there in the beginning, that he was part of creation. And that makes him part of the triune God. All right, then John gets into giving us some evidence. He, he's giving us evidence that Jesus is the Son of God and that belief in Jesus will bring us to eternal life. It's his main purpose, and he wants to prove that in many different ways. The first proof that he gets into, really, is John the Baptist. <clears throat> so, let's listen to what he says about John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. So, we know two things about him. First of all, he's not God. He's a man. Okay, He was sent by God, but he's not God himself. 
Second of all, that he was sent by God. He has a mission. God had a purpose for John the Baptist. Okay. And let's, and his name is John. Those are the three things we learn about him in the first sentence. So let's look at verse seven. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him all might believe. Think of a witness testifying in a courtroom. That's basically what he's saying is that God set it up so that there were witnesses who could testify to others. I saw Jesus. I saw his miracles. I know he was from, from God the Father. I know he was God incarnate. Th these are people who can serve as witnesses. And witnesses are very important when we want to um, believe in something. We, we need to know for sure. And witnesses can testify to what they've seen and what they've experienced. And so that is what John was sent to be. And what's he going to testify about? The light. Jesus. <clears throat> so that through him all might believe. And then, and then John is very clear. He himself was not the light. In other words, John is not the one we're going to worship. John's not the one we're going to follow. John's not the son of God. He is not the light himself. He came only as a witness to the light. So if you think again of a courtroom trial, a witness is not the real person. He's just the one who's testifying to what he's seen. Okay. He's not the one who actually is on trial or anyone who's going to be acquitted. He is simply there to testify, to lead you to the truth, really. And that was totally John's purpose. <clears throat> so we know he's a man. We know he's not God. We know he's going to tell about the light. And the purpose of that is so other people will believe. So that is basically proof number one is John the Baptist. And his message. Let's see what his message is. This is verse 9. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. John the Baptist is a precursor. He's saying, guess what's coming? The light. That's going to that's gonna brighten up everything. That's going to make every life full of light. The light that comes from above. So that is his message. The true light that gives that light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him... The world did not recognize him. So here John, not John the Baptist, but John the Apostle, is saying, Jesus came into the world, just like John the Baptist predicted. And even though he was in the very world that he made at creation, remember when we talked about the word was with God and through him everything was made, so Jesus came into a world that he himself created. And yet... His own did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. So he's saying, here he is in the very world that he created, and people are not believing in him. <laughs> it's just, it's mind-boggling to John, obviously. He says, yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. He is saying everybody was able to believe in Jesus. Some will, some won't. If you're going to receive the light, then you are going to be a child of God. And he's saying Jesus came into this world that he himself created, and yet some people didn't recognize him and didn't accept him as the Son of God, and therefore they did not believe in him, and they did not become children of God. But if you receive that message and believe on Jesus Christ, you're a child of God. There's that adoption again that we have talked about before. It's kind of like we were lost little orphans. And when we accept Jesus and receive what he has to offer to us, he calls us with the light and we, and we believe in him. He just takes us right under the father's wing. And he says, if you are mine, then you're the father's. You're a child of God. 
You're no longer just out there an orphan. You, you belong to me and you belong to God the Father. So that is exciting to feel like we belong. And he's saying, what kind of children? This is verse 13. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. This is an interesting reference now to being born again, because later on when, he, when Jesus talks to Nicodemus, he goes through this again, being born again. But here John is very clear about the fact that this is not a physical birth. This is not, uh, this is not the result of, of a marriage or a husband and wife. Um, this is not, not anything to do with that. It's being spiritually born again. <clears throat> and the children that come to God through Jesus, which is us, are not born like a human way, but we are born of God. We're born anew, in a way, that when we become a child of God, we we get all kinds of gifts of being part of the family. We're also almost like we're reborn. That's what John is saying. So now he's going back to the Word again, and he says, <clears throat> The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh. That is as close as John gets to talking about the manger. <laughs> he says, the Word, meaning Jesus, became flesh. Jesus was born. It's interesting that this sentence comes right after the, the other sentence about the fact that we are born anew in God through Jesus Christ. So Jesus himself had a human birth so that we could have a spiritual birth. He came to earth as a human being. It's almost like saying Jesus put on flesh and move into the neighborhood. <laughs> I think I heard somebody at my church say that. Maybe it might have been, my, maybe it might have been Sue said, it's like Jesus put on flesh and moved into the neighborhood. Okay, so he, he dwelt among us, meaning he lived next door. He lived right here where you and I live, wearing flesh, you know. And again, notice that this is not the beginning of the story, John is saying. He was always, Jesus was always, because he's eternal, always was, always will be. He was with God of creation, which is where the whole thing started, and now... He's putting on flesh. It's his choice to come down to earth. And um, it, it, it's an interesting, mind-boggling notion of God becoming a man, you know, for us, out of his love. Um, and and it, here's the proof number two in this verse. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. Now, who's we? Obviously, John is now talking about himself and the other believers who were following Jesus during his time on earth. So he says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. So he's almost saying that if you've seen Jesus, you've seen God the Father. Okay, The grace and the truth, the grace and the truth that is beyond human understanding, they have seen that. They've walked with Jesus. They've ministered with him. And again, we're back to that idea of revealing. It was Jesus in the flesh that revealed God to us. And that's part of the proof that John is setting forth. He's saying, first of all, Jesus was with God in the beginning, so that proves he was God. Second of all, God sent John the Baptist to preach and witness, to testify that Jesus was coming from God. So that's the second proof. And the third proof is we've seen his glory. We, we've seen that he's more than just a man, more than just a teacher. Um, it, it's, I, I'm really enjoying going through how he is setting out everything one by one. And being so organized about uh, explaining that the, the one and only son, you know, some translations say the unique and perfect son. He's saying 
there is nobody like Jesus because he's God. Uh, and full of, you know, unfailing love and faith and grace and truth. He's like the perfect model, the perfect teacher, the perfect savior. How could he be those things if he was just man? He couldn't. So therefore, John is setting out another proof that Jesus indeed is more than a man. He was God himself. God in the flesh. There's going to be more proofs as we go along here. And he's going to talk a lot more about John the Baptist. And I'm learning a lot about John the Baptist. I had never really studied too much about him. It's kind of like I always thought, well, you know, he just was before Jesus. So why look at him? You know? Why not look at the real thing? <laughs> but of course, everything in the Bible is worth studying. It, God, it's there for a purpose because God knows that he can use his word to open up things in our hearts that we didn't even know we needed. You know, it's great. Well, I've enjoyed being back with you again today. And I'm hoping to, um, now that I'm on the mend and I'm better, <laughs> excuse me, I'm hoping that I will be able to continue uh, on a regular basis. So... Um, until then, um, Thanksgiving is coming this week. I am extraordinarily grateful for how much better we both are, my husband and I. So, um, I'm feeling pretty grateful and I hope you have a day full of gratitude yourself. Have a good one.